Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night study. Prophecy in the news this week. Let's start with Israel news. And this came out. Biden threatens Netanyahu's drive to destroy Hamas. The latest example of the Biden administration is repeatedly uh, exploring the possibility of leveraging arms shipments to Israel to place pressure on Netanyahu to scale back the war against Hamas. We're sticking our nose in again, which we shouldn't. The uh, continuing threat Hamas's terrorist infrastructure poses to Israel's security has prompted Netanyahu to warn that the IDF operation to destroy the organization could last till 2025. The Israeli uh, prim Premier has also reiterated his long-standing opposition to the creation of a Palestinian state, which is absolutely ridiculous that they even think about a Palestinian state, America, which he insists would become a launching pad for attacks against Israel. Of course it would. So Biden has been ambivalent about Israel's request to destroy Hamas. At first he came out and said that he totally backed Israel. Now he's backing up. Now he's talking, and put, talking about putting pressure on Netanyahu. So the deepening rift between Biden and Netanyahu was clearly evident during the latest exchange between the two leaders via phone. While Netanyahu again voiced his opposition to the creation of a Palestinian state, and rightly so, in their 30-40 minute call last Friday, Biden focused on reaffirming his commitment to work towards helping the Palestinians move towards statehood. Biden doesn't know what he's doing. He needs to stay out of the Middle East. Statehood is absolutely the last thing that they need for Palestine because uh, they, are, they are destined and determined to wipe Israel off the face of the map. And what they'll do is they'll gain the West Bank back and they will definitely be able to hurt Israel all around. So it's definitely a, a bad, bad thing. Biden, again, like he touches everything, it turns the rust. He has the Midas touch in reverse. Let's go a little bit further. Israel faces a war on seven fronts. This article came out this week. In recent comments to the Knesset, Israel's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, declared Israel is fighting a multi-front war. <clears throat> Excuse me. He further noted Israel's coming under attack from seven threats, Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, Judea, Samaria, and that's an Israeli term for the West Bank, Iraq, Yemen, and Iran. The history of Israel is replete with wars and fightings. Ancient Israel fought to take possession of the Promised Land. God promised that Israel would prevail over their enemies as long as they stayed true to His commandments. The Bible also foretold that Jerusalem would be a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples in Zechariah, a very heavy stone for all peoples in verse 3 of Zechariah 12. Peace in Jerusalem appears to be impossible until Jesus Christ comes and reigns. So the Bible instructs us in Psalm 122.6 to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we need to, because I just heard today that Israel is planning, and I don't know how far it's going to go, they're planning an all-out attack against Hezbollah to the north. If that's the case, then we're going to see some really strong, strong things happening in that Middle East, and it may expand that war. Let me go a little bit further and give you a little bit about the economy. Contrary to what Biden says, our economy is not getting better. Our inflation rate is down, but down from what? Down from a huge inflation rate. Inflation is still with us. The rate could come down, but you're still paying high prices. So this one comes out this week. Mainstream media is collapsing. Good riddance. Thank God. Should any of us be surprised that the news industry is being hit by a massive wave of layoffs? Survey after survey has shown that the American people have lost faith in mainstream media. It's about time. And millions of us have decided to turn to other news sources for our information. Mainstream news outlets have been bleeding viewers and readers for years. And now many of the biggest names in the news industry are losing staggering amounts of money. News industry is being hit particularly hard. The Time Magazine, for example, laid off an uncertain number of staffers across departments this past Tuesday. The CEO of Time Magazine, Max Sibley, said in an internal memo to his staff, we have made the difficult decision to eliminate roles uh, today across several departments, including editorial tech, sales, and Time Studios. He also writes, just look at what's happening to everything else around us. And we also know that it's happening in California. Largest newspaper in California, the Los Angeles Times, has decided to eliminate more than 20% of its newsroom. The cuts will impact at least 115 journalists, about 20% of the newsroom. Some 94 of those cuts will be among ununionized employees, meaning a quarter of the union will be laid off. Should we be sad that the Los Angeles Times is imploding? I don't, absolutely not. Elsewhere, Paramount plans to ax hundreds of workers. It's a parent company of CBS, and so it's likely that the news division at CBS 
is about to go get even smaller, thankfully. And uh, the news division of NBC is shrinking as well. It laid off several dozen staffers this week. Sports journalism has also fallen on hard times. At this point, it appears that the future of Sports Illustrated is very much in doubt, and many of the magazine's employees will now be searching for new employment. All over, the, all over stories that I just shared with you have happened within the last seven days. It's crazy how rapidly things are happening now. It appears that the U.S. economy has reached a critical tipping point. The economic outlook for 2024 is not good at all. Don't believe anybody that tells you, or Biden or any of his cronies, that tell you we're, we're coming out of inflation. We are not. Um, and employers are racing to cut payrolls in anticipation of what is coming. So if you currently have a job that you value, hold on to that job as tightly as you can, because a lot more layoffs are on the way, I'm afraid. And you don't want to be without a chair when the music stops playing. Let me give you another, another part of the economy. Most Americans are literally living on the edge of financial disaster. We've been telling you this for months now, and it's getting worse and worse. There's a tremendous disconnect between the economic numbers that the government is giving us and what most Americans are personally experiencing on a daily basis. The government says that inflation is low and it's coming down more and more. Uh, but Challenger, Gray, and Christmas, which does surveys, says the numbers of layoffs was up in the U.S. 98% last year. The government says that the economic outlook for 2024 is positive, but companies all over America are acting as if extremely hard times are ahead. So who are you supposed to believe? Well, here's my rule number one. Never, and I mean never, believe the government. Ever. Because they lie to us constantly. A majority of Americans say that a $1,000 emergency expense would be too great of a hit to their savings, and they could not afford it, according to a new data related to this past Wednesday, last Wednesday. More than half the country is literally living on the edge of financial disaster. That's absolutely crazy. Um, nearly half of all Americans have $500 or less in their savings accounts, an amount that leaves them vulnerable to unexpected expenses, according to a Go Banking Rates survey. Few hold much cash in their checking accounts as well. $500 or less in their checking accounts. Most Americans we have been financially wiped out by just one major accident or one major emergency. The government continues to insist us, though, that inflation is low. But everyone knows that that's a big fat lie. Insurance rates have been spiking at a particularly high rate. One man in Las Vegas was horrified when his auto insurance bill shot up by 72% in just eight months, even though he had no accidents and no tickets. Another man recently posted a video on TikTok in which he, ran, he ranted about how the cost of literally everything is absolutely soaring. Four years ago, he said my rent was $1,200 a month at a luxury apartment complex. It's now $2,400 a month, not including utilities. Three years ago, my electric bill was at averaging $45 a month. It's now averaging $145. He said, I went to the grocery store yesterday and got three bags of chips. He needs to lay off the chips. Some ground turkey and some vegetables, and it cost me $67. $67. U.S. consumers are being squeezed like never before. And as a result, debt levels have been rising to unprecedented levels. NEADA said one out of every six rate payers is behind on energy bills. Large companies all over America are feverishly laying off workers. This is not good news, and you're not hearing it anywhere. Even eBay is now laying people off. They cut 1,000 jobs last week, and 10% of its full-time workforce. The worse economic conditions become, the more crime we're going to see in our country. Looting has already become a way of life in some areas of the country. In Washington, D.C., a CVS store is permanently shutting down because dozens of teens will literally loot the store multiple times per day. Staff claim more than 45 school kids would go into the store and steal chips and drinks in the morning. After their classes and late at night, it would close on February 29th because they would go in the morning and rob, then they go in at night after their classes. So we're living in a time when most Americans are literally living on the edge of disaster. And I hate to be a harbinger of bad news, but for everything I read and see, disaster is coming. Millions will be wiped out. And it's pretty sad when you think about it. But that's the state of our world. I want to give you a couple more things tonight. This one is under war. Global Americans are funding Hamas, not starving children. Be careful 
and I, I know you're aware, but be careful with your relatives of who they want to support. We have bleeding hearts, and uh, that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing if we don't check where we're sending our money to. The images from the war Hamas launched on October 7th in Israel have tugged the heartstrings of Americans, and that's good. Uh, I don't refer to the charged ruins of Israeli communities in southern Israel that were devastated by Hamas programs, nor do I refer to the horrific evidence of the terrorist rampage of murder, rape, and torture, and kidnapping that is too graphic for most people to hear. As far as the international media is concerned, these victims were quickly forgotten almost as soon as it happened, and all the focus turned to the Palestinian the Palestinians and the millions they say that are there that are suffering. The suffering of the people of Gaza is real. I don't want to make light of that. Uh, regardless of Hamas's popularity or the widespread support of its people for other, and other Palestinians for its genocidal goals, the destruction of the, strip, of the Strip and deaths of many of its civilians, even if the claims of Hamas health ministry that are frequently cited by mainstream press are completely unreliable, it's still a tragedy as well as a completely avoidable situation. Following the voluntary charitable tradition that has always been the hallmark of American life, many people in America are donating millions upon millions of money to charities that claim to be giving aid directly to Palestinians in need. They are not. Palestinians impacted by the war, uh, excuse me, they say that it's actually going to feed, clothe, and house Palestinians impacted by the war. And basically, except there's a very little evidence that the money raised in the United States is ever reaching its intended targets. Even worse, there's good reason to believe that it's likely winding up in the hands of Hamas terrorists who seek not only to, per to perpetuate the bloodshed, but believe that they benefit from the suffering of their own people. Bloomberg has noted that Hamas has been receiving between eight and $12 million in donations raised in the United States since October 7th, almost $12 million since October 7th. And money is being snatched up by the same Islamists terrorists who have been stealing the finances of other and other types of goods that have been sent their way since they seized control of Gaza in 2007. Many of the groups raising money for Gaza are brand name charities like Oxfam or Save the Children, United Nations like the UN Crisis Relief, UNRWA, which actually has found out this past week have had some of their employees, the UN, the UN, a UN relief group bringing food to the Palestinians Several of them were involved in the raid on October 7th. Still some somewhat famous names that are there like, well, let me read this to you so you know. Among celebrities that are backing this, who have raised money for the NR, UNRWA, is Ella Emhoff. You may have never heard her name. She's the daughter of Doug Emhoff, who is the nation's second gentleman and the stepdaughter of Vice President Kamala Harris. She is Jewish but she's against the Jewish nation. She's an anti-Semite, if that's possible, it's an oxymoron. But she's raising money for the Palestinians and sending it to the UNRWA, among other groups. Her somewhat famous name has likely helped another group called the PCRF raise more than it might otherwise have done as it began its push for donations since October 7th. Hamas has effectively controlled UNRWA, the UN Refugee Agency for the Palestinians, with many of its employees belonging to the Islamist terrorist group, the point where Palestinian nonprofits end and Hamas begins really isn't clear. Those who give money to aid Palestinian victims of war may not intend for their donations to go to Hamas, but they do. Virtual signaling, and that's what people do. They virtual signal. They feel guilty because they have something and they want to give. But virtual signaling your support for Palestine by raising money for the UNWRA may exactly be the kind of thing that helps keep a B-list celebrity like El Ella Emhoff in sync with liberal fashion. No one, however, should be under any illusion about, this sort of, about what this sort of philosophy funds. Anyone who really wants to help Palestinian civilians and to ensure that money raised for that purpose goes to just that should demand the Hamas surrender. It's also a guarantee that charitable donations intended for suffering Palestinians will continue to go to Hamas. There's no guarantee. Let me give you another thing on the war. Are we on the verge of, war, of a war with Iran? And I'm sure you heard by now, three American soldiers killed in a raid on Jordan, in Jordan, which, while we're in Jordan, I don't even know, but we were there right on the Syrian border, and they got killed. We've had 165 attacks so far on American bases uh, inside, inside that, in the Middle East. And this one has taken lives and wounded 40. 
U.S. lawmakers are calling for military strikes now inside of Iran, Iran after the aftermath of a horrific attack that left, again, three U.S. service members dead and dozens wounded. So if the U.S. does hit targets inside Iranian territory, how will the Iranians respond? Well, the truth is that the U.S. is already at war in the Middle East and it appears that it could soon take an apocalyptic turn. Sunday's attack was the first one that actually killed members of the U.S. military. Biden blamed Iran-backed groups for attack. I'm tired of hearing him saying that. When someone attacks your forces more than 165 times, you're at war with them, whether you want to claim it or not. Anyone who thinks otherwise is just being delusional. In response to Sunday's attack, Joe Biden told the world, quote, we will hold all those responsible to account at a time and in a manner of our choosing. Are you kidding me? Listen, he went on over and over and again, warning before this happened, if you're thinking of escalating this war, don't. And he would make that emph emphatic, don't. His secretaries of war said, don't. Uh, Blinken said, don't. They kept saying, don't. Well, the, the thing is now, they did. Now what do you say? Please don't? Sometime down the line, you have to do something. Have no doubt, we will hold all those responsible to account at a time and a manner in our choosing. That's what he said. Needless to say, that's not strong enough for many Republican hawks in Congress. Mitch McConnell, a Republican, says this. He called for serious crippling costs to Iran. Lindsey Graham said in a statement that, he, that the attacks on the U.S. has carried out on Iranian proxies outside Iran will not deter Iranian aggression, calling to, quote, strike targets of significance inside Iran. I'll tell you what you need to do. It goes on and on. Tom Cotton said the same thing. John, John Corian said the same thing. I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to take out the Ayatollah. You take out the Ayatollah, and basically, it's, you're going to stop everything. Meanwhile, the Chinese continue to probe Taiwan's defenses. The Taiwan's defense ministry announced on Saturday that over 30 Chinese warplanes were headed towards this country, in addition to naval ships. An apocalyptic conflict in the Middle East would give China the perfect opportunity to try to reunite with Taiwan by force. And let's not forget about the Russians. Over the weekend, they took even more territory from the Ukraine. That is a that is a black hole war. They're just pouring money into a rat's hole there. This is a time of wars and rumors of wars. Those who are familiar with Bible prophecy knows that Jesus said this. We should hope for peace, peace, but we should also prepare for war because war is definitely coming and it'll shake billions out of their current state of complacency. Now, I wish I couldn't say that to you, but I'm telling you it is. China's economy is tanking and the only way a country usually gets out of an economic mess is to start a war. China's ready. They have all the incentive they need. Let me give you this one about religion. Before I do that, let me tell you that I've done something recently that's kind of interesting. I kind of went down a wormhole. Any of you that heard me speak in, about Revelation, which is on YouTube and being hit continually right now, uh, we know that there's four horses of Revelation and they, they, uh, God gives us the colors. Green, black, red, and white. And we know it's for famine, death, war, and conquering. But other than that's obvious, I started to look at these colors and I started to remember, I've been to the Middle East almost 50 times, started to remember some of the flags of the Middle East. And I did a little bit of searching and I am absolutely dumbfounded at what I'm going to tell you. So the Four Horsemen's colors mean something, but red, green, white, and black. Here are the country flags of many of the nations that oppose Israel. Look at the four colors of those flags. Palestine, Libya, Kuwait, Jordan, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, UAE, and that last one is Yemen's flag. Since 1990, they changed it. All those flags I showed you, look at them again, have those four colors, only those four colors. These are all the nations that surround Israel and that are aggressive. Coincidence? Maybe one or two of them. I don't think that's coincidence. So my question is, is God trying to tell us something? Is he trying to tell us that the, that the chaos of, of revelation is actually found in these nations? Well, obviously we know that from history that it is. So just think on that for a moment. Uh, when I went down that rat hole, I just kind of thought, my goodness, this is unbelievable. Under, under prophecy, when churches dismiss Bible prophecy, they do so to their own detriment. Although prophecy constitutes almost one-third of the Bible, its importance is constantly downplayed by those who dismiss it as having no practical significance or by those who object to it on the grounds that it's a fad 
that takes people's eyes off Jesus. This is what mainstream churches are doing right now, especially in America. User-friendly churches. They will not touch revelation or anything to do with prophecy. And that's really a shame because the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Such cavalier dismissals of Bible prophecy fly in the face of scriptures like, of, like Revelation 19.10, which states the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So if prophecy is properly taught, there's no reason for it to divert anyone's attention away from Jesus. In fact, it should serve to emphasize the centrality of Jesus. Is prophecy practical? Well, consider all the New Testament writers testify to the fact that, to the fact that living with the anticipation of the Lord's return will motivate holy living. So consider these facts about prophecy. Number one, it's quantity. One fourth to one third, as I told you about the, pro about the Bible, is prophetic in nature. It includes the Psalms, the major and minor prophets, the New Testament entire books like First and Second Thessalonians and Revelation are devoted to prophecy as are major prophecies and passages like in Matthew 24, 1 Peter 3. To ignore Bible prophecy is to ignore a significant portion of God's word. Secondly, its uniqueness. No other book in the world contains fulfilled prophecies. That includes the sayings of Buddha, Confucius, the Quran, the Hindu Vedras, the Book of Mormon. It certainly includes the ridiculous nonsensical quatrains of Nostradamus, that means nothing also. In contrast, the Bible contains hundreds of specific prophecies that have already been fulfilled. Prophecies about towns and cities, nations and empires, political leaders, as well as about the Messiah. One example is in Isaiah. He names, he names Cyrus as being the one who would release the children of Israel from Babylon, and it happened 142 years after Cyrus was born. Excuse me, it happened 142 years before Cyrus was born. Prophecy is a validator of scripture. Fulfilled prophecy is one of the best evidences I know that the Bible is inspired word of God. It's a validator of Jesus. The prophetic scriptures validate Jesus as who he said he was, namely God in the flesh. The Bible contains more than 300 prophecies about the first coming of Jesus. Absolutely astronomical nods, odds for, for prophecies to be fulfilled. He's the revealer of the future. Prophecy serves to tell us some things that God wants us to know about the future. I don't know how you can live today in America or anywhere actually and hear all that's going on in the news and not understand that it's, that's, it's flowing into prophecy. As a matter of fact, my knowledge of prophecy gives me hope. It lets me know that this is not something that's, out of, that's not something that comes out of, the, out, of the, out of the whirlwind. This is something that's been predicted. The Lord has predicted this. The prophets have predicted this. That we knew that that something's going to happen right towards the end of time. Number six, it's a tool for evangelism. Think about the people who tell you, oh, I don't know what's happening in our, in our world. If you know prophecy, you can tell them. It's a tool for moral teaching. One of the great recurring themes of the prophets is that obedience is better than sacrifice. It's a generator of spiritual growth. Prophetic knowledge encourages patient waiting, provokes earnest watching, and inspires dedicated work. That's from Isaiah 5, James 5, Matthew 24, and 2 Timothy. It gives us an understanding of current events. You can't interpret anything that's going on in our world without knowing prophecy. I just showed you some flags that's more than coincidence. That's something that backs right back into prophecy. And it's significant, significant of the season. One of the most exciting reasons for Bible, studying Bible prophecy is that it provides very definite signs, and we'll talk about that in our study tonight, that we are to watch for which will signify the season of the Lord's return. We don't know the day or the hour, but we do know the season. Bottom line, God's prophetic word is food for our spiritual growth. We need to take it off the shelf, open it up, and feast upon it. We need to do so with believing hearts. Bible prophecy, properly taught, can literally transform, transform a person or a congregation. It'll happen if the person or congregation can be convinced of two things regarding prophecy. Number one, Jesus is returning. And number two, his return could, could happen at any given moment. Let me give you a little bit more on religion. China following the Nazi playbook and its tactics against the church. I won't read it today, I'll tell you what it's about. There's a book out by a scholar, Susanna Herschel, her book's called The Aryan Jesus and Germans with God. And what they did was, the Germans did this, and I know this from reading history, the Germans, Hitler supposedly was Catholic, although he was not. He was not a practicing Christian at all. Hitler made Nazism and dedication to the Fuhrer the number one commandment. They actually wrote 12 commandments, the Nazi, the Nazi propaganda machine. The 12 commandments was you had to be loyal to the state, 
to Nazism, and you had to be loyal to the Fuhrer as the only one who can give you instruction. They took big Bibles out of churches and they replaced them with the Nazi Bible. They started rewriting scripture. They used the same Bible, but they started rewriting it. Well, China is doing the exact same thing right now. They're making the Chinese Christian church, the national church, start to submit to the CCP. CCP. And what they're doing is they're replacing Bibles. They're, re cha they're changing verses. They're changing things about Jesus. And they're demanding people be allegiant to China and to Xi Jinping. But Beijing's repressive government attempts to usurp the role of God, just like Nazi Germany. He and his word cannot be overcome, though, we know that. While it's tragic and outrageous that the Chinese government feels so threatened by the good news of Jesus Christ that it desires to pervert his written self-revelation, Xi's efforts will not succeed. Altering the text of scripture to confirm to the evil objectives of a morally bankrupt state will, will be about as successful as trying to grasp sunlight. They will go down just like Nazi Germany went down, just like Hitler went down. Let me give you one last one, which is good news. And I'm seeing more and more of this, and I'm really thankful. So this is Purdy, is Brock Purdy, 49ers quarterback. He credits Jesus for Super Bowl run. He, listen to what he says. The second year quarterback who led San Francisco to a come from behind victory in the NFC Championship Sunday, and thus into the Super Bowl, says he learned, he leaned on his faith in God when his team trailed by 17 points and prayed at one point, quote, win or lose, I'm going to glorify you. I am so thankful that these people are taking their platforms and they're using it for the Lord. And in spite of everything that's happening in our world, we can see that there's something going on spiritually also. So be encouraged.